speaker will have a mic or the speaker will be? Why don't we have the speaker? Okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and get going. So if everyone would like to take their seats, we have an action-packed two-hour event. All right, so thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's a beautiful day. We get to overlook the lake. My name is Matt Ruark. I'm a professor in the Department of Soil Science here at UW-Madison. Uh, I also serve on the Madison Steering Committee for the Dairy Innovation Hub. Um, so we have roughly two hours together, and the way this we structured this is each hour has its theme. We're going to spend the first hour talking about technology, have a couple speakers. Uh, it might take some Q&A, but then have a longer time for a panel discussion at the end. The second hour focuses on management in dairy production systems. And, of course, the broadest theme that we'll be discussing today is land and water stewardship uh, as it relates to dairy production systems. Uh, so... Uh, as we, uh, just one other quick comment, uh, just that we have the, the, uh, the steering committee for UW-Madison for the Dairy Innovation Hub is very active in the creation of this event, uh, trying to, you know, finding the latest and greatest research to, to present to this, to this audience. And a big thanks to, to Maria for pulling this all together. So with that, I lose them already. There you are, Joe. All right, so uh, Dr. Joe Sanford's our uh, first speaker. He's an assistant professor in the School of Agriculture at UW-Platteville. His position is funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub, and his research interests uh, are in agricultural wastewater management, including farmstead and edge of field runoff, nutrient management, and precision manure uh, nitrogen management. So, with that, welcome Joe. Sure, we're going to have you. Actually, sure we're going to need this for QA. Okay. All right, I'm going to start talking. She's going to get someone. All right, so uh, yeah, my name is Joe Sanford. I'm an assistant professor at UW Platteville um, in the um, soil and crop science department down there. Um, I was hired as an ag engineer for agricultural wastewater management um, back in 2020. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, a technology that's kind of coming out on the market for manure application, which is uh, real time nutrient sensing to apply nutrients to the field in real time based on the actual composition of manure. I don't know what you want me to do here. <laughs> Just describe what you're Describe, is okay. Yeah. But right now I got a title slide that has a title of my presentation, uh, where we are right now, um, and my name. Um, I guess important thing, just before we start, um, to talk a little bit about the Dairy Innovation Hub and the collaboration. Um, so this project that I'm going to be talking about today started um, when I was actually a postdoc at UW-Madison uh, with Dr. Digman and Dr. Larson. Um, I left to go to Platteville. They were very sad, um, but they hired Iris Fang as a postdoc to follow me up, who recently just took a position at North Dakota State University. Um, and we now have a research scientist on the team, Tyler Lisko, uh, who's actually right now out in the field applying manure, so I don't have to be out there, so I can be here. So. Um, it would be a beautiful day to be applying manure, though. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, it is really a collaborative effort um, between UW Madison and, and UW Platteville, which I think kind of brings together what the hub's all about. Yeah, didn't do anything. <laughs> is that your slide back there? That's my slide back there. If everyone wants to turn around, I guess we could. It's back there for some reason, it's just not up there. We got it. Okay. So I'll go ahead and get started. So here's my beautiful title slide. We'll move on um, just to talking about uh, manure. 
a little bit more. So um, I give a lot of presentations on manure um, around the state. And you know, I always like to talk about manure a little bit in the side of things of, of being a resource, really. When you hear about manure in the news, it's usually not for good reasons. Um, but manure really does have a, a pretty crucial role to play in um, nutrient, uh, nutrient cycling and farm set sustainability. Um, you know, we have livestock, they need feed. We need to grow those crops to feed to those animals. They need nutrients, right? The manure those animals produce have nutrients in it, and we can use that to, to um, apply to our fields to provide some of those essential nutrients for crop production. Um, but in terms of kind of advancing this sustainability, a lot of work has gone into sort of the processing side of things, into the storage, anaerobic digestion side of things, but not a lot has gone into the actual resource in terms of, of nutrients application in the field. Um, and this has really become a, a hot button issue in recent years because um, you know, fertilizer prices have been so high and people are looking for alternatives um, to synthetic fertilizers. And so manure has a huge role to play in that um, it, in terms of you know, nutrient cycling on the farm. However, while manure is a great resource for agricultural production, crop production, um, it does come with its limitations and issues. Uh, a major issue with manure is that um, in general, manure is not very balanced in terms of what we want from a crop production standpoint. All right, so um, this graph here is kind of the, the, the dotted line is if we were to apply manure to meet a crop's nitrogen need, all right, those bars are how much excess phosphorus and potassium would be applied to the field, all right? And so uh, we now know that applying all the manure to meet nitrogen needs generally results in this over application of phosphorus, and I'm sure everyone in Wisconsin have heard of the phosphorus issues, legacy phosphorus issues. And so we have that buildup um, in the soil, um, you know, it contributes to phosphorus in the runoff, um, and we all want clean water, we want healthy soils, and so this becomes a, a concern. Other thing with manure nutrients is when we store manure in a pit, all right, manure settles, all right, and with that settling, we have settling of nutrients as well, particularly phosphorus. Studies have looked at the difference between phosphorus at the top of manure lagoon to the bottom of the manure lagoon can be almost 300% difference in that phosphorus content in that manure, all right? And so from an agricultural production standpoint, we want to apply manure that is as homogenized as we can get because we just want to take one sample, send it to the lab, that's our nutrient concentration for that manure. Um, and so farms will use manure agitation. Um, and so um, there's recommendations on how to agitate those pits. Um, little side note, this picture is taken from the last manure expo that was in Wisconsin where just after this a bunch of people got sprayed with manure um, because a salesperson didn't know how the little agitation boat worked and pushed the wrong button. Um, and so, um, you know, on the side of that too is, you know, farmers are not always following this, these recommendations and we know that there's still some variability in that manure, right? And so Dr. Larson, who I used to work with, uh, who's environmental sciences now, um, she did a study a few years ago looking at this variation in solids content and nutrient content from 16 different farms that were emptying their manure pit, all right? And so they all said they were following agitation practices, all right? Um, but here, this is looking at the total solids. And so we can see a really high variation in that total solids for some of those farms, all right, as they're pulling. So these samples are pulled at different intervals um, of the manure or the manure lagoon emptying process. And we see a pretty high variation in that total so solids, all right? And with that, we see pretty high variation in total phosphorus as well, all right? So you imagine as that farmer 13 there is going out to their fields, they're applying manure based on a composite sample that they took earlier in the year or using a sample from last year to apply that phosphorus to the field, they could be either very much over or under applying that phosphorus. All right, and we see the same thing for total nitrogen as well. All right, a lot of variability in that total nitrogen um, coming out of that manure lagoon, and so this is an issue from you know crop production standpoint in terms of are we over or under applying those nutrients? And so the kind of the question is, what can we do from here, um, and how can we improve this system of applying nutrients to? our cropland um, to improve this nutrient use efficiency of phosphorus and nitrogen primarily, the two nutrients that from an environmental standpoint 
we're typically most interested and concerned about. Um, and so a technology that is not necessarily new, um, but new to manure is near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, and so NIRS, um, essentially what this technology is doing is it's using a light source and a sensor, right? And we're getting, um, I'm not gonna go into the chemistry because that's Matt Digman's thing. It's not necessarily mine. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, we get responses in that detector, all right? And we can relate this, these responses to different things like nitrogen concentration and phosphorus concentration in the manure, all right? And so in the lab, this has been done since the early 2000s. Um, however, there's a lot of challenges in terms of taking this technology to the field uh, because you know, we have temperature variation, we have solids concentration variation, things like that in the manure. And so it really hasn't been out in the field until fairly recently. However, the idea of being able to use NIRS and to apply manure in real time is, is very appealing. Um, there's a lot of potential here. Um, and essentially what this system does is, sorry everyone on that side, I'm gonna come over here. We have this little box here. And inside this box is we have a Harvest Lab 3000, um, which is a John Deere product um, that is an NIRS sensor. And the manure essentially, as it's getting pumped out of the back of the tanker, goes through this skateboard here. And in real time, that sensor is determining the concentration of nitrogen, phosphorus, ammonium, and potassium in real time. It's sending that information then to the tractor, all right? And so if we've uploaded maps to say exactly how much nitrogen or phosphorus we want, the system will then vary the application based on that actual concentration in real time. And so in terms of the potential of this system, it really has the ability, potential, to reduce that sampling variability that we see from that manure lagoon, all right? And so we know there's a lot of variation as we're pumping out. We don't really have a great solution for dealing with that. This is a potential to really reduce that variation as we're pumping out those storages, all right? At that same time, we can improve the accuracy of all of our nutrient applications because not only does it adjust our application rate at, uh, in real time, when we're done with this, it'll give us a map that'll show us exactly the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that went out on that field. And so when we go back then to supplement with synthetic fertilizers, we have a better idea of what actually went on the field with that manure as well, all right? Um, <clears throat> and we know from a um, you know, regulatory standpoint, um, regulatory manure management is always a topic of concern. And with the technology being able to read these nutrients in real time, it might have the potential to kind of reduce some of the regulatory burdens um, of you know, going through that sample data that farms are sending in because it'll just come in a spreadsheet potentially to the DNR, DAT cap, and places like that, right? But there are a lot of concerns. There's a lot of infield complexities that come in here. Um, the sensor has also been shown to be more efficient at predicting nutrients such as nitrogen compared to some of the other nutrients like phosphorus and potassium. And so there's things to, to look into and improve this technology, which a lot of NIRS scientists are, are, are doing. Um, but the big issue is there's a lot of, there's not really many field studies that have shown that this is actually gonna have an impact. Um, and so our objective of this Dairy Hub and USDA critical ag research study uh, was to look at, is the sensor performing and doing what it says it's supposed to do? Is it applying nitrogen like we want it to? And how is it gonna improve the overall efficiency in terms of nitrogen use efficiency, phosphorus use efficiency, things like that. So in our first study here that I'm gonna talk about, uh, we were looking at, essentially looking at the ability of, can this system perform um, like it's supposed to? And so in the system, you should be able to go in and say, I wanna apply X amount of nitrogen per acre, that tractor then, that spreader is supposed to apply that much nitrogen per acre. And so what we did is last fall, we went in, we set on our, our, our display 75, 105 pounds of nitrogen per acre, right? Those were our two treatments and we used two different methods to apply this. We used what a lot of farmers typically do, which is applying based on last year's manure composition data averaged during manure lagoon um, um, pumping. Um, and then using the sensor to do that in real time, all right? And this is what we found. So the blue line here, this is our traditional method using um, data that we sent out to the lab, averaging it, 
and determining the application rates in gallons per acre. And uh, the orange bar is the NIRS sensor doing what we asked it to do, right? Apply that 75 or 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And what you can see here is that that traditional method in this particular year, all right, was over applying nitrogen, all right? And so when we use that real-time NIRS sensor, all right, we got much closer to what our actual applied rate was supposed to be, all right? And as we increased that application rate, we saw there was a higher increase in um, that traditional over-application as well. So about by 25 pounds um, per acre, all right? The other thing to bring attention to is the variation, all right? So we did this uh, five times, five times, all right? And so looking at the variation here, so these are standard deviation bars, that sensor kept that variation much smaller than what we saw with our traditional um, um, sampling method. Two minutes, all right, I'm cruising now. All right, um, so the next thing was to look at uh, field variability and how this system can potentially work in the field. And so we set up a trial then to look at um, essentially comparing applying manure based on using fixed rate technology, variable rate technology, and then bringing the NIRS sensor in there. And so what we did here was we wanted to look at if we use the system to apply nitrogen using these three different methods, would the NIRS sensor improve that application, all right? And in this year, you know, we were looking at yield. We didn't do a lot of soil or uh, testing for this field. Um, we'll look at kind of nitrate losses potentially. Um, but in terms of yield, we didn't really see much of a difference in this, this current year um, in terms of the, the, the using the sensor versus the other more traditional methods. Um, however, we did see, just like we saw with the manure application, there's a lot less variability in terms of yield in our NIRS sensor um, 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 plots. And so one of the reasons for this um, that we thought might have been the reason was, so we were doing this out at Arlington. Um, Arlington does have a history of having pretty wide variation in uh, the total nitrogen in that manure. Um, and so this was kind of looking at past six years, and this is what we were seeing. So we didn't really see a lot of variation. So that was one issue um, that we had last year um, with this field, um, with our data maybe not showing a lot of conclusive results. Um, we also saw that there is some phosphorus in the soil. There's a lot of phosphorus variability in this field in the soil, which, which caused a uh, possible kind of not being able to see the, the significant differences between the treatments. Um, so right now, Tyler's out in the field right now applying our next study. Essentially what we're doing right now is we are kind of trying to force that variability in the manure. And so we're doing a much more detailed study looking at nitrogen um, and trying to see how it improves our nitrogen use efficiency. So we're going to be doing a lot of tissue sampling, a lot of soil sampling to kind of look at that nitrogen losses from the system and then also looking at that yield. All right. So I'll skip the conclusion, and I'd just like to say thank you um, for having me today. Uh, it's been an honor. Um, and this was funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub to start with and is now funded by the USDA. So I don't know if I have time for questions, but. We have time for one question. One question, all right. Question. I'll be around all day, well, too. We, do have, uh, we will have a panel at the end. Were you using a stabilizer with the uh, nitrogen application? A stabilizer, yes, we, hmm. that's a good question from Matt, actually. Matt and Tyler, I'd have to ask them um, if we were using a stabilizer or not. I'm not sure. Sorry about that. I'll text them another day and get an answer for you. And we can have more follow-up later. So all right. let's all thank you. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Tadeo De Silva. Did I get that anywhere close to right? Okay. Uh, he is a, currently a postdoc in animal and, uh, excuse me, animal and dairy sciences at, here at UW Man uh, Madison and is uh, mentored by uh, Dr. Cabrera here. Uh, you're just PhD in animal science from Federal University of Vizosa in Brazil. So with that, help us please welcome Dr. Tadeo, or I'm sorry, Dr. De Silva. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, 
Where is the presentation? Oops. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm just going to take a few minutes before the real treat because Tadeo is going to show live uh, a tool that we are developing. And we think we are developing the most user-friendly decision support tool that at the same time uh, calculates the greenhouse gas emission on dairy farms, but it's very scientifically sound the best we can. So. Uh, Basically, the root problem we are trying to address here is uh, calculate, estimate the best we can the greenhouse gas emissions on dairy farms. Dairy farms emit greenhouse gases, and we need to do whatever we can to decrease those emissions the most we can. But as you can see, the system is very complex with many uh, components and many modules, and our challenge is to try to capture all of them in our model that at the same time needs to be user-friendly in order to be uh, available for final decision makers at the farm level. There are great models out there. Uh, actually, we are part of this very large national initiative called the RUFAS, the Ruminant Farm System Model, developing a very uh, research-oriented uh, simulation model with several components on the farm. But the problem with this very sophisticated research-oriented uh, models is that normally they don't end up in the hands of the final users and they don't become uh, tools for decision-making at the farm. We are not trying to compete with those. Actually, as I said, we are part of that uh, initiatives. We are part of those initiatives. Uh, what we want to do is complement that. And we want to do, actually, uh, <clears throat> following the philosophy of make the right balance between practicality and a still robust, robustness and scientifically sound model that is able to estimate at the first step, what's going to be the standing environmentally of dairy farms? And based on that, uh, they can follow up with the consultants uh, and, and with the professionals to follow up with more sophisticated and large models. So in, in, in a nutshell, we're looking for creating this simple, minimalistic, robust, heavily robust, and a still user-friendly whole farm decision support model uh, containing the most important components of the dairy farm. So we include the herd, the barn, uh, the manure, and uh, many other components, crops, and we also have the economics along those sides. But the main idea at the end is to have a good estimate of greenhouse gas emissions and more importantly, to calculate the best we can the delta. What's the, uh, the impact of strategic man management decisions on the change of the environmental standing of a dairy farm? And without further ado, I will let Tadeo explain the actual model. So uh, thank you, Victor. You, yes, sure. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I guess, I can, yeah, okay. All right. You're already using it. Good. <laughs> so, um, um, good morning, everyone. So now we're going to see the tool. And um, yeah, let's take the tour already. Oh, let me, yeah, so the size is okay. So, all right, so um, as Victor was saying, we are developing this tool in a modular uh, fashion. So, and as you can see in this, uh, in the left side, we have the basically the modules uh, that are the, the tool is composed by. So, but the first part and the, the most important is this herd calibration, because from here, uh, all the other modules that will be populated with the outcomes from, from this part. So as you can see here, 
we have this, this box where we put this uh, herd information. Basically, here we have all the inputs mostly related to the milk and cows. Uh, the calves and the, the milk composition, this is the part where the, the user put this, this information. Also, uh, we have the diet information for um, lactating cows, dry cows, and heifers, simple information. And uh, there is this question where we uh, ask for the user if, uh, let's say, the farmer has any kind of uh, strategy for reducing the enteric methane. And once we, uh, we actually we already have a kind of um, set uh, on, on average herd for Wisconsin. So once we, you have put all this information, it's simple like that. You just run the tool uh, with this, this button. So you can see here in this first page the, what we would expect on average in terms of the, the, the herd demographics for this simulation. So yeah, and you see that uh, the model runs in a matter of seconds. So that's the idea, it's to run and, and get the results uh, fast. So, and we can see in this uh, dashboard, simple dashboard, some outcomes from the model, like dramatic intake, water intake, milk yield, uh, corrected by fat and protein, feed efficiency, and some graphs showing the, the behavior, or like actually the pattern of each variable over the lactation, right? Uh, the manure excretion and some uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in this case, you're going to see that uh, we just have here uh, the, mainly the, the methane emissions, the enteric methane. And uh, yeah, so uh, the idea of the tool is to, like, uh, to offer to the user this uh, user interface and, and facilitate the way that uh, the, the, the user would interact with it. So for example, let's say, let's suppose that the farmer or the, the nutritionist of the of this, this farm has changed the, the level of NDF of this diet. So we would expect that, there, I mean, when, once you change this, uh, there is an um, uh, impact on the greenhouse gas emissions, mostly the methane. So let's say that the, in this case, uh, instead of having 30%, we would have like um, 25, okay? So if you run the model, again, if you pay attention at this number, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it reduced. So, yeah, I was expecting having a button to, to, to put the number, but yeah, that's okay. So, if we run it again, we're going to see some change. So, I mean, from the initial scenario, uh, we had a uh, decrease in like 15 grams per day of uh, methane. So, the, that's, that's why we believe this tool is so powerful. So, you can change some inputs, ask some modifications, and easily get the results. Uh, for nutrient excretion, we, are, uh, we also have uh, the excretion based on the diet uh, for nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. All right. So once you run this, you're ready to go to manure handling, which is a very interesting part where we, uh, we work it on. So we have all these inputs for the, the manure, which is basically the, defines the, the location of the farm, the type of facility, uh, bedding, um, the type of manure, and the type of management. But something that I would like to focus with you uh, in this simulation and uh, get your attention is that, for example, let's say that in this case, the farmer has, uh, is emptying the storage twice a year, fall in the fall and the spring. We have more options here, fall, just in fall, just in spring, or, just, uh, or fall and spring. And let's pay attention on this number here. I'm not going to explain to you all these cards, but this is the total of methane emissions from the, the storage, okay? So um, it's, as you can see here, it's almost eight tons per year being emitted from the manure storage. So let's say that uh, for any, some reason, the farmer wants to change this for just, oh, let's just empty it in the fall. So just that to simulate some scenarios with you here. So you're gonna see that the number has changed a lot. So it's almost three times more so as you can see here, uh, we are, um, I mean, with just a few clicks, we can simulate some different scenarios and, and get this results and see the impact on the emissions, okay? So uh, here there is the, the, the emissions in terms of um, methane for the barn, for the, 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 the storage. There is the ammonia emissions as well, which is not exactly um, a greenhouse gas, but um, ultimately it can be converted to nitrous oxide. Uh, and see, here we can see the temperature 
throughout the year, and the in the blue line is the, the methane emission. So it's it respond, it responds to the, the temperature. Okay? So if we move forward, so we have the that part too, which which is the where we put the purchase feeds. So basically here we have already set the list of feeds and uh, with this condition. So we the, the user just provides the the, the feeds, the amount of feeds, and uh, behind of the scenes, oh, two minutes. Uh, yeah, um, we have the, the, the calculations for the, the greenhouse gases. So, uh, and the same for the crops. So you define the, t the crops you have in a farm and put out the informations like the type of crop, area, and the fertilizers, et cetera, lime, as you can see here. And here we can see the, 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 the emissions. And we have this also this part where we put the, the some because we have some uh, uh, economic analysis, the diet cost, milk price, and the fuel consumption, which is important for the, the greenhouse gases. So, and by the end of the, the the simulation, we can see as you can see here, we have this dashboard where we summarized everything. So, and one of the most important numbers here is this one, which is basically in a, an a approximation of the carbon footprint of this farm. And here we can see that we are breaking this number down. Like uh, we can see that the, the, the herd is contributing the most for the, the, this, this number, the manure handling and the, the crops is the third one. And here we can see proportionally. But if we move back and change something here, and let's say that we put like uh, fall and spring again, and we look at this uh, dashboard again, we can see that we could reduce a lot the, the emissions or the carbon footprint in this case, just changing those scenarios. Uh, and here, uh, we have the nutrient balances, in this case, nitrogen. Uh, we are working uh, to have uh, the phosphorus and potassium as well. But we can, as you can see here, we have all the this imports, which are the purchase feeds, fertilizers, legumes that are grown on the farm, as many exports, the milk sold, actually the nitrogen in the milk, cold animals, the barn, which is basically the ammonia, uh, manure storage, ammonia and nitrous oxide, and also uh, nitrogen, which is leached. Uh, for Wisconsin, in this case, uh, we are considering 30% of the nitrogen, which is applied at the field level, uh, is leached. And here we have the balance. So in this case, this, for this specific scenario, the farm is running in a, with a positive uh, balance of nitrogen. And lastly, we have this, uh, this card showing basically some indicators of the economics of the farm, right? And yeah, that's all. Hmm. Yeah, I made it. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? I'm more welcome. Do you have time for a few questions? Okay. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah, a couple of things uh, model validation. Also, can you show users uncertainty of predictions? Oh, this is Those are really key because you're, you're going to several decimal places implying high precision when, in fact, that may not be the case. Yeah, that, yeah this is a, a very good point. Yeah. Actually, uh, this is not exactly the last version of the tool. So, I mean, the, these numbers are in the way that, uh, that I put in here, mostly because uh, all the models I'm using behind of it, uh, they are lying like in metric uh, units. So to like uh, match the numbers and check if they're good or not, uh, I'm using in this way. But our intention is, this, uh, is that in, by the end of, in, like in the last version, we would change this for more like farmer units and we would put some less decimals in this case. And regarding the vari variability, I mean, we haven't thought about this. Yeah, so uh, this is a, something that we, we might consider for the, this last version of the final version of the tool. Yeah. We're going to have to hold uh, for the, the remaining questions for the panel just for the sake of time. So help me thank our speakers. Oh. And our last uh, speaker of the technology focused session is Dr. Albert Harding. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, very good. Dr. Harding is the chair uh, of the Department of Soil Science.
Yeah. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you for the Dari Innovation Hub for inviting me and for supporting some of our work. Uh, um, I much enjoyed this crisp genome editing talk this morning, like probably many of us, and I, I had to think of a little story that happened when I grew up. I grew up on a dairy farm, and uh, uh, we had cows, obviously, and I remember one, one day that an extension agent came. They, they didn't come very often, but they, they came and uh, talked to my parents, and I was present of that. I, and he asked my father, uh, not my mother, though they, though they did both the same. He asked my father, what, what are you breeding for? So they, we, had, we had MRI cows. I don't know if you know what they are. They're big, blocky cows, dual purpose, both meat and, and milk, so to speak. And he asked, he asked, what are you breeding for? And my father was a cow person. So you know, there was the typology at that time was, the, you had two types of farmers in the dairy industry. You had the tractor the tractor farmer, and you had the cow farmer. And my father was a cow farmer. We had no tractor. Anyway, he asked that question, and my father said, well, I breed only for one, for, for one item, and, and that's character. He really liked He liked a cow with a, with a good character. Any cow that had no good character, kick, kicked the bucket, for example, was, was sent to the butchers or, or the neighbors. And then I remember my mother sort of shaking her head, and I said, yeah, I, I wish he would breed for milk. That's... <laughs> Right, now what? Prox I missed my title slide. No, there it is. All right, anyway, I I'll, uh, I'll say a few things about proximal sensors. It has nothing to do with CRISPR-Cas9 or anything of that, but may maybe all with technology. And uh, I, I should say the technology in, in, in my world, uh, no, that's not a proper sentence, but the technology is often ahead of the science. And we see that probably in many fields, that the technology is out there, and the science is somewhat catching up, or, 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 or perhaps in a different direction. So that, that's one thing, and I acknowledge all my, my co-authors there, yeah? So I, oh, here it is. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about proximal sensors and how we define it as a field-based center to obtain signals from the soil a bit, like uh, Dr. Stanford already defined. Uh, there's several types of them. I'll come back to that later, whether they measure invasive or non-invasive, whether they use energy or, or active or passive, whether they are stationary or whether you can have them on the go, and whether they measure directly or indirectly a particular property. And the cow is probably the best one. I should say that too. That tone of the cow, as we know, is probably a very refined, the best proximal sensor you can imagine. That tone has, just like our own, like our own tone, has a, has a great ability to scan, to scan things. Something that we should think about, perhaps, of, of using her for that. Uh, much of this proximal sensing is all based on the electromagnetic spectrum that we use very extensively now. Previously, we used you know, about 400 to 700 nanometers, the visible spectrum, so to speak. But in the last, there are say 30 or 40 years, maybe a bit longer when it comes to radar, of course. Uh, we've used the entire one. We've used the, the high wavelength, the long wavelength, the short wavelength, and we've used all of that for measuring and observing soil properties uh, across landscapes. Uh, and, and, and on sites. And I'll give a few examples of this. Uh, we know that much of the technology is thankful for what's been done elsewhere. And uh, You see the Mars rover here, uh, costed about a billion dollars. You see, oh, that, that's kind of expensive. It's, it's about, it, it is, it's maybe, it's maybe expensive, but with $46 billion generated every year in the dairy industry, a billion dollars is probably not, is not that much. Maybe, maybe we should have this thing somewhere. So uh, we, we generate a lot of new data, both remote and nearby. Uh, remote, of course, we know all that. There's lots of examples how people use uh, previously Haley's and kites, but now, of course, drones are very popular. Balloons we used to be very popular. Aeroplanes are still popular. Satellites, of course. And, uh, and the proximal sensors, are, I'll, I'll explain a little bit the four different ways that we can group them whether you measure invasive or non-invasive, whether you measure on the spot in the field or whether you take the sample to the lab, dry it or do anything else. Uh, whether it uses passive energy, so you measure what's generated from the material or you actively inject energy in it, like an XRF, for example, and then see how the atoms get excited and tell you what it is. Uh, whether it's mobile or stationary, uh, whether you measure the element or the 
the object directly or indirectly. So those are the different ways that you can look at them. I'll give a few examples here. Uh, technology has been around for about 30 or 40 years, not very widely used nonetheless, the ground penetrating radar. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it works very simple. Uh, it uses a, a time for distance uh, approximation of depth. So if you were to scan, for example, for a drainage pipe or gravel or any other item that might be of interest, you run that thing across the landscape uh, and then you can generate uh, sort of two-dimensional maps as been shown in the left lower picture, something like it. And, and it tells you something about particular properties that you might be interested in, like I said, drainage or gravel or, or anything that is obstructing uh, the soil profile. Uh, how come we don't use this very much? Uh, 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 I guess the software that comes with it is difficult. So much of the radar, uh, the software is difficult. And, and um, yeah, I guess that's some of the main reasons. It, it's, hard to do, it's hard to do very large areas, for example. If you were to do the entire Dane County with a ground penetrating radar, you, you better start running marathons or something. The other one, uh, not very popular here either, is electromagnetic inductions. Work very well, of course, in landscape where you have uh, uh, salt, very simply said, or high EC, high electrical conductivity. Uh, you run it across the landscape, it generates a, a current that you then pick up, you pull it off at the end of the day, uh, and you can quickly generate any EC map and then validate that map with uh, some of the measurements. Um, I think it's quite widely used in the central sense, for example. Uh, it works well there, uh, but not so much used in, in many other areas. And then, of course, the, the thing that's been widely used is a portable X-ray uh, that uh, instantly, within a minute, gives you about 30, 40, if not 50 elements uh, at uh, reasonable accuracy. I should say always um, absolutely wrong, but relatively correct. So that is often with these, uh, many of these proximal sensors, they're, they're relatively correct. If you look at changes with depth or if you look at changes between different profiles, often these numbers are quite correct. Uh, and you can generate them, you can hook it up to your laptop and Bluetooth your data within, within uh, minutes. Uh, already mentioned, uh, diffusive reflectance spectroscopy, uh, particular MIR. I should say mid-infrared spectroscopy, probably the most promising technology, not, not the most promising, but the, the best technology for much of what we do. Uh, because uh, it gives a, a, a lot of information on many of the key soil properties, particularly in relation to soil organic matter. Uh, I should say if you ever were to go into spectroscopy, uh, you, you can consider VNAR, the, the visible near-infrared, but the, I would say buy a mid-infrared for, for about 30 or 40k. And, uh, and you're, you're, you're quite ready. It requires a bit of grinding. We've, we've discovered over the years that um, uh, the in situ measurements are possibly not the best, and that's because you've got interference with uh, moisture, so you better dry the sample, ground it up to whatever microns you wish, and then, and then use it. Uh, it is uh, fast, I, I should say, compared, certainly compared to wet chemistry, and it provides an, an enormous amount of information. So the mid infrared is probably the way to, to go for, 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 many, for many of the measurements that we do. Now, 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 now I will say a few things about how, how we use that, that proximal sensing and all, uh, lots of other technology in what I would call digital soil assessment. So we have, uh, uh, dare I say, a small revolution in the way that we look at soils, sample them, analyze them, and map them, and the sampling there has been uh, uh, enormous efforts in producing better sampling schemes. Uh, in general, uh, uh, using less samples for better information, so to speak. Uh, we, al we always think that we need to take more samples, which is often true, uh, but we have lots of ways. Uh, the Latin hypercube sampling scheme, for example, that uh, reduces the number of samples to produce a much better answer. We also have better ways of using what we call legacy data, so com combining legacy data with what we have already uh, yields often better sampling schemes. We have uh, other tools. Uh, 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 we, we've, in the past maybe five or ten years, learned to move from uh, in-field assessment to back to the lab, uh, particularly for the MIR that works better, for the XRF2, and that is because of the moisture interference that happens in the 
in the, in the field, certainly over 10 or 15 percent moisture uh, that is affecting many of your readings for these proximal sensors. And then uh, I, I won't say much now, but uh, the, we, we have quite a few progress in, in the mapping of soils, which is called uh, digital soil mapping. So I'll give a little example of that that we've done some years ago in the Driftless area here. Uh, a lot of cows there. Uh, as you may know, the Driftless area, many of these soils have that red clay layer uh, that is uh, called round tree in some parts of the Driftless at, uh, at a particular depth, which is uh, perceived to be the remnant of the weathering of that underlying uh, dollar stone. And uh, that has, has many, two minutes, that has many implications particularly for manure, that, that red clay is a monolithic clay that holds on to the phosphorus and is uh, probably better if you apply a lot of manure. Uh, we've been able to predict the probability of that red clay. And I think uh, some of the questions earlier were about the uncertainty. Uh, we, we, we much like uncertainty. I think it's a very good way, the meteorology people have done that for decades, telling us there is 20% chance of half an inch of rain. Here we say the probability of finding a certain uh, uh, area of red clay. And you can see the higher, the higher the probability, the smaller the area that we're certain that there is that particular clay. So I think that's a good way of going move forward. Uh, and then we compared that, the areas, uh, and then compared it to the current NRCS data and see how much we've improved. So <clears throat> at last, I want to put a little idea here out, the, the concept of Beauvinoir. Um, you all know what terroir is, do, those of you. Uh, uh, there, might, there might be a concept of Beauvoir that might be very valid for uh, Wisconsin. Is this idea that there is an environment that determines the health and production of dairy cows. There might be certain areas where we have certain cheeses come from that are related to the soil. If you look at those three maps, we know where the dairy farms are, we know where the soil regions are, and if you overlap them, you can say there is some, something there that perhaps should be looked at or not. That, that's just an idea here. Right, uh, I, I will say the way ahead is that we can quickly, quickly do soil conditions. We can assess, identify, map them. Uh, we can regionalize our understanding. I think that's the key to much of what we do, uh, to have understanding but regionalize it. We have to talk about uncertainty. We have to talk about the dynamics. We have the tools and we're gonna try all that in the coming, uh, in the coming months in uh, Marshfield. So it says stop, I will. Uh, we, co we compare Mars to the Earth. We, we, we know we, we, have, we have that thing on Mars and, and just compare what we have on Earth. We, we should have a thing like that running across the Wisconsin landscape. It's only a billion dollars, folks, so with that. Uh, and I should also say we should use the cows, perhaps their hooves, their tongues, uh, put sensors in there, let them walk the field and generate the data. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was going to point out um, one disadvantage of ground penetrating radar might be the cost. I think those units are still quite costly. My other question is, does LIDAR have any uh, applications in the type of research you're discussing here? Thanks. Right. So I, I think a good point. GPR is costly. And it is costly because it never took off, perhaps. I think things that take off, there is some sort of a law, the more people use it, the better it's. LIDAR is very widely used for digital soil mapping. So we use that a lot in predicting soils across the landscape. Good point, yeah. And I think there's a 30 centimeter LIDAR for most of the counties in Wisconsin, freely available. Thank you, everybody, for, for your presentations. My question is to Victor and Tadeo, and maybe addressing, you know, going back to the questions of uncertainty. So you have two levels of uncertainty, probably, the model uncertainty and then the stochasticity of the production, right? When you say fertility or interval, uh, uh, Kevin interval and so forth, 
So when you say simulation, are you, are you simulating data or you're just plugging the values on your model and getting a, a deterministic result? Because if you simulate, then you can at least add the uncertainty of two farms of the same size, same management, they are gonna produce different levels of uh, methane just by chance, right? So you can just have an idea of this variation. But then model, I don't know what, what kind of models you are using. So how to include model uncertainty, yeah. that's more, it's more difficult. Huh? Yeah, yeah, but uh, this is a, a very nice point. First, because I mean, we didn't have time to go like so much in detail with the model, but first, uh, uh, all those, those inputs for the herd, actually we, we got them and we have a Markov process generating the data. So this is the first part of the model where we kind of, we are simulating the, the herd demographics throughout the year based on this Markov chain process. And all the other models that we are including here, like the for milk and milk production, um, body weight and drama intake, and all of them are deterministic. So, yeah. yeah. The exactly, yes, yes, yes. Just the average, yeah. Which should represent pretty well the farm, yeah. Like, well, Keep the microphone. I have a question for you too. I, All right. I, I work for uh, I'm general manager for a dairy cooperative, and our farmers more and more are being asked uh, with the Farmers Assuring Responsible Management uh, program to animal care and now into environmental stewardship, and uh, being asked you know to try to gauge you know what our greenhouse gases are, and you know right now it's a you know online or paper form kind of thing that they do. On your model, I noticed. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see, you didn't have anything there with regard to the production of the cows. And then on your model, you were only, is there only one or the predominant system for the manure management? Because it, I mean, I'm looking at this tool as far as the information, it could be, it could be very valuable in that, but just questions on that as far as, because we're just trying to get, gather more information for that, because uh, suppliers and buyers are, you know, wanting to, uh, know whether my, our farmers are you know, involved in environmental stewardship. If you could just address that. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I mean, I, I just showed the, in, the case, in the case of the manure, for example, one scenario. Yeah, for example, but, I mean, we, we do have there, for example, if uh, the farmer does a biodigester, biodigester plus uh, a solid leaked separator. So we have some other alternatives. I know that we are not covering everything yeah, but it, that happened mostly because of a bit of time. Yeah. And uh, also because, the, I mean, for me, honestly, it was the most complex part to, to work, was the, the, the manure part. Because there are so many processes that could happen and so many variations. And uh, it's not that easy to find on the literature uh, models to, to include here, so it, it's hard. And even the models that we already have available, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's not that easy to reproduce those results. So, I mean, uh, and I see that there is a lot of opportunity to, for research on this area you know, and try to cover more potential scenarios than all of these emissions from there, yeah. Thank you. A uh, question uh, for, for the speakers that discuss a little bit about sensors, you know, and uh, application of those. Um, one of the comments made is that sometimes they are not very accurate, you know, um, and, you know, it's understandable that this is the case. I guess my real question related to that is how inaccurate those are and how can we compensate for that to using the field? It's going to go. <laughs> All right. Yes, I've heard that too, yeah. <clears throat> so I've also heard that many other traditional methods are not very accurate. So uh, that's not really a very nice answer, I realize that. But there is uh, inaccuracy in many of the things we do. Uh, I would say the big difference is that with proximal sensors, for example, the amount of data generated is so large that uh, pr probably these errors weed out uh, compared to traditional. Uh, and let's just say you have a, a, a two-acre field and you want to have some idea of the pH distribution in that field. You, you take maybe 10 or 20 cores. 
uh, and then analyze them. Uh, you, you know the error in the pH measurement. But if you run, uh, uh, if you run them on the MIR, and you can take many more samples simply because it's easier to detect, uh, I, I think the quantity of the samples weed out the possi possible inaccuracies. So uh, maybe Joe has a, has a better insight. Yeah, I'll just add to what Alfred said is, you know, from a manure standpoint, you know, the, the, the method right now is you agitate your pit, you take 10 samples sent to the lab, that's your composite, right? Compared to the NIR, which is constantly getting data, thousands of data points a second, um, and, and, and applying the manure based on that. There, from the manure standpoint, there's some inaccuracies, particularly with the models when it comes to phosphorus potassium. Um, the sensors don't directly read phosphorus and potassium, like they can nitrogen, and so there's some, um, you know, in the model, some assumptions that are made that based on total solids and nitrogen, this is your phosphorus. And there it become inaccuracies there, and that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I was trying to do this study for phosphorus application, and I got pushed back from my collaborators saying it's not accurate enough for phosphorus yet. Um, but, you know, they're running hundreds of more samples through those devices, and those calibrations are getting better and better every day. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Joe, would you say that um, for the sensors on the tanker, is more of the variability, do you think more of the variability for the traditional methods comes from the variability of manure nutrient content as you get to different parts of the pit or from the rate applied by the tanker? Do you feel like the rate applied by the tanker is consistent enough uh, that we can kind of like call that a control factor and then control for the variability of the nutrient content or are they both working in tandem? Uh, they're, they're both working in tandem a little bit. I mean, there's some variability during the spreading as well. But a bulk of the variation is going to come from that as you're emptying load to load. Um, it's not new information. We've known it for a long time um, that, you know, as you get to the bottom of your pit, you're going to have more phosphorus. And that's an issue, particularly in Wisconsin, where we're dealing with, you know, that variability. And so one thing from the standpoint of the sensor, you know, we have fields that need different nutrient needs, right? Different amounts of phosphorus, different amounts of the nitrogen. So another idea behind this sensor was that, you know, maybe it's not as important in real time, but load to load. You know, can we take a sensor and put it on the pump that we're pumping out, get an average for that load, and then based on the concentration, we can target specific fields then. We may not need to agitate as much either because we can then take fields that are a little bit more, sam tankers that are a little bit more dilute, take them to the fields that don't need as much that, or that are closer to the farmstead and then the more nutrient-rich tankers we take farther away, so. We have time for one more, one more question, one more break. Um, Tadeu, how did you calculate feed efficiency? <laughs> Don't you want to ask? No. Uh, just a very simple calculation. Uh, the milk yield corrected by fat and protein and the dry mat intake, which we calculated in the model. Yeah. So, and we are, for those who are using the NRC models. Yeah. All right. Please help me uh, thank all the speakers. <laughs>
start our next session here. All right. All right. Good morning again. It's not afternoon yet, so it's still good morning. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with our next session. We're already a couple minutes behind according to that clock because we uh, gave you... That, oh, clock, is that clock is fast. So we're just right on time. That's great. Um, so good morning. My name is Amber Raditz. I'm the program manager for the Ag Water Quality Program within the Division of Extension. And that program also houses the Discovery Farms, which is kind of a something special from Wisconsin that, um, like Jeff pointed out earlier, has kind of some roots in um, how the Dairy Innov Innovation Hub came to be. So um, I oversee the project development and outreach for the research that's conducted by Discovery Farms and then the outreach that's conducted by our Ag Water Quality Outreach Specialists. So this session, we're going to run it just a slightly bit differently. Um, we, I'm going to introduce all three speakers. And the reason we're doing that is because those talks really tie nicely together. And so um, we're going to introduce all three speakers and then have all three speakers come up again at the end for a panel, just like the last session. So I'll go ahead and introduce those speakers. Our first speaker is Matt Ruark. Um, and you already heard from him, so you know him. Uh, Monica Schauer serves as the, currently serves as the research director for the Nitrogen Optimization Pilot Program, which is new to Wisconsin. The work she's going to talk about today relates more to her master's work uh, that she completed with Matt Ruark. But uh, her and Lindsay Rushford are doing a great job working with those farmers across the state on trying to better manage and understand nitrogen use through those on-farm research trials happening as we speak. And our last speaker in this session is Lindsay Hartfield. Lindsay joined our Discovery Farms program in January as the research program manager. And prior to joining Discovery Farms, she completed her PhD in agriculture and biosystems engineering from Iowa State University. So we're super happy to have Lindsay here with us as well. So Matt, you're in charge. Thank you. All right, so this uh, over the, I don't know if this is, if this is too loud. I, is it too loud? Otherwise, I have to use my indoor voice. OK. So we have this, this broad theme, land and water stewardship. So what we're going to talk about across these three presentations is the idea of soil health. What are the benefits of dairy production systems to the landscape? And then delve into some management challenges and the things that we can do within our dairy production systems to improve soil health, to improve, uh, to uh, enhance soil conservation, and also improve water quality. So we're going to start with the idea of soil health in Wisconsin dairy systems. So uh, I don't know, for those that are unfamiliar with so how we, when we talk about soil health, what do we mean? We often use the NRCS uh, definition, you know, the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So that's a pretty good definition. That's a broad definition, but I'm a scientist. I need to measure something. So what are we going to measure? Well, we have three types of categories of things in soil we can measure. We can measure the physical properties. We can measure the biologic, bi bi biological properties. We can measure the chemical properties. And soil health sits right in the middle. So we want to encompass all the components of soil, all the things that make soil soil, and uh, put those together to, uh, in our assessment, right? OK, what do we, what do we measure? So when I talk about soil health measurements, I'm really going to talk about, we're going to focus heavily on the biological properties. And why is that? Well, physical properties are hard to measure. And I'm lazy, right? No. So, but there are things that you have to go out into the field and measure in situ, right? Um, compaction, uh, uh, infiltration, uh, erosion. But there are also things you can see, right? So you can just, sometimes the easiest thing to do is, uh, Let's put a shovel in the soil. Can you get, can you get a shovel into it, right? You can, you can see your erosion issues. You can see your compaction issues through a, a lack of infiltration, right? So sometimes those are just the, the things we can visualize. The chemical components of soil are all the things that we measure, and it's probably the, the oldest part of soil science, all the pH, um, all the nutrients that are in the soil, things we actually, and we actually know what to do with the, that information. We use those to guide nutrient management uh, for different crops. Okay, so... Now we got to incorporate biology. And the, and the biggest issue with biology is that it's complicated, right? So 
the, our, our opening speaker, right? There's a lot of, the, in the biological sciences, there's a lot of complexity to it. So we got to break that down and find what's the simplest thing we can measure that still might have value. And we'll talk about uh, uh, what some of those things are in, uh, in the biological properties. So the other big component is, okay, that's great. Soil health, it's a great concept, but is there really value in it? Well, so our angle is yes, there's value, especially in tracking over time. We wanna make sure we're not leading to a degradation. If we can track your biological properties, maybe you're introducing a new practice on your landscape, you wanna know if it's having a benefit. Um, soil health is important to track over time. It has some potential usefulness in nutrient recommendations, and it has some potential usefulness in telling us something else about the system. I put this under the idea of ecosystem services, and the primary one that we might be interested in is yield. So that's a, those are entirely other talks, but there's a lot of promising work connecting soil health with nutrient recommendations and with uh, yield potential on soil. All right, so we're gonna focus on four different measurements uh, that we're gonna generally categorize as biological. And we wanna focus on carbon pools, and nitrogen pools. And so the way that we're, uh, we're breaking this out, so we have carbon and nitrogen as the different pools, and then we have the laboratory method that we're gonna use. So we can use a biological incubation, we're gonna let the microbes do the work, measure the reaction at the end, or we're gonna do a chemical extraction. And we're interested in chemical extractions because this is something that can be done pretty quickly. So uh, for soil test labs, for something that uh, uh, a farmer can, can use and get some information quickly, uh, the method itself has to be fairly simple. So we have a couple different approaches to the measurements and we're gonna measure carbon and nitrogen. So the first one is a carbon pool. It's a chemical extraction. It's often referred to as active carbon permanganate oxidizable carbon or pox C. So you can think about it's, it's, it's an extractable pool of carbon that, we, that we've related to certain, um, that has a certain value. Also on the nitrogen side, we can extract a soil nitrogen pool, an organic nitrogen pool. You can think about it as maybe a pool of nitrogen that will become plant available over time. Or we can just do incubations and test the mineralizable carbon. So we incubate, we take soil, we incubate it, and we measure the amount of CO2 produced over time by the microorganisms. It's a, kind of an assessment of activity um, of, the, of the microbial populations. And on the nitrogen side, doing a potentially mineralizable nitrogen test. So letting the microbes mineralize the nitrogen from their organic pool into a plant available pool, ammonium, and, and letting that be the measurement. So you can see a lot of these have a lot of uh, potential connections, right, is, you know, we're trying to do a quick extraction of an organic pool that might become the mineralizable pool. Um, so we can see, well, which ones are valuable, which ones are more sensitive to management, and which ones can tell us something interesting about, um, about soil health. Okay, so what, we, uh, what we've done along with, uh, through our Discovery Farms program, through funding from the, uh, the Dairy Innovation Hub, through funding from uh, Wisconsin Soybean, through funding from all sorts of places, We've conducted uh, several, uh, uh, several different studies that have, has, that have measured soil health on Wisconsin fields. So at this point, we've got a data set of 624 data points that, um, from fields that were sampled from 2015 to 2021. Uh, and we look at these, we've looked at these studies individually, but we've decided we we're going to combine all of our work together. And then let's see what kind of production systems um, do we have in this data set and what can we learn. So we were able to break out this data set into four common cropping systems. One is an annual cropping system, uh, annual cropping system, so your traditional corn soybean rotations. It's still uh, fairly pervasive in the state of Wisconsin, right? Then we also have, actually I'm gonna flip it, I'm gonna go the other way. We start with pasture. So we can go from a, from a dairy system with that, that's on pasture, so uh, no row crop agriculture. We can go to forage-based, uh, crop rotation, so basically what, we're, what we call dairy-based crop rotations. They receive manure, they have alfalfa and rotation. Those are the two defining characteristics of those. Then we move into annual systems, and we have annual systems with and without manure. So you can think about as we're going, I guess, from the, the bottom to the top, we're working across a system, let me go the other way, from the top to the bottom, systems that become, um, that have more properties that we associate with soil health. We have more soil coverage, with less soil disturbance, uh, more organic inputs, greater crop diversity in the rotations. Okay, so are these, are these soil health properties, do they allow us to, to uh, differentiate anything about these systems? So if we start with a, a fairly common soil measurement of soil organic matter, 
This is something that is included in every routine soil test uh, that, that's conducted. And that's just, you can think about it as the bulk pool of organic material in the soil. So instead of, instead of those pools of carbon and nitrogen that I talked about for soil health, this is the bulk pool of organic matter. So interestingly, the only thing that differentiated, uh, that separated out was the pastures. So the pastures had greater organic matter on average compared to all the other systems. So in terms of organic matter, these other, these other systems weren't very uh, influential. However, when we look at other measurements uh, of, these, of these soil health measurements, that's really where things started to separate out even more. So generally, uh, always the pastures always did the best in terms of you know, these biological properties. But as we look at our forage-based production systems, alfalfa, manure, they, uh, they generally, in three of the four measurements, generally separated out from annual systems. And if we look at just the effect of manure alone, right? So we go forage-based, alfalfa, and manure. If we just do manure alone, manure with annual systems, that was separated out in some of our carbon measurements. Okay, so what, is this, what does this matter? It means that these, these measurements, these biological measurements are sensitive to management. And at the broadest scale, they're, they're sensitive to the management practices that we think about when we think about soil health building. So if you think about on the left, right, we're going from an annual system, corn, uh, soybean, one crop at a time. Uh, perhaps there's a little bit of tillage in there, but there's no other organic inputs other than the crop residues. We go to a forage system, alfalfa, grown for several years in a row, deep rooting, a lot of carbon inputs below ground. We have the manure applied, additional carbon. We're increasing the soil biology as well. Then you go all the way to the pasture systems, right, where we have uh, no disturbance, a perennial landscape, and those will have the, uh, the greatest values. So it really does demonstrate like where, where the value of our forage production systems fit in. Uh, and the biggest part of it, right, is integrating livestock into our, into our production systems. So as we move forward, though, we have to think about, okay, manure and dairy-based crop rotations can lead to greater soil health values, but there are trade-offs with water quality, right? So I keep mentioning alfalfa, that's great, but we also have corn silage, which has leaves exposed soil and usually is connected with fall manure applications. And with that, I'll bring up uh, Monica uh, up next to talk about how to manage cover crops in these rotations. All right, thank you, Matt, for that. So as Matt mentioned, I'm going to be talking about opportunities for water quality improvement in dairy production systems. So corn silage is a major crop grown in Wisconsin. We're the top producer in the United States, and it's grown on about 1 million acres of cropland annually in the state. We grow so much corn silage because it's used for dairy feed. We're America's, da we're America's dairy land. We've got lots of dairies. And with those dairies comes tons and tons of manure, literal tons. Um, and manure storage a lot of times is limited on these farms and the farmers need somewhere to put this manure. So fall manure application on a field that looks like this, a chopped corn silage field, is something that we commonly see in Wisconsin systems. But with that, you can see that field is empty. There's really no living cover. There's not much um, any residue on the soil at all. So when you add that manure to a field with little living cover, little residue, we can have some water quality issues. That manure is on that field for you know, seven months before that corn is planted, um, and that leaves a lot of time for those nutrients in the manure, especially nitrogen, to leave that soil through leaching, and we can run into issues with water quality by contaminating drinking water and also contaminating nearby waterways so we get those um, environmental consequences. So what can we do? What kind of opportunity do we have to improve this? Cover crops are a tool that we can utilize in this system because they're grown. We can plant them after um, that corn silage harvest in the fall. Rye is a cover crop that establishes really quickly in the fall when there isn't much time before winter. It is very hardy. It survives the winter. And then it puts on a lot of biomass in the spring. That rye can then be terminated, and that corn can be planted. So we've, we're, covering, we're providing soil coverage during that window when that soil would have otherwise been bare and where we run into those water quality issues. And we know this, the literature really supports that rye as a cover crop can really uh, reduce nitrate leaching. This is a graphic from a meta-analysis that looked at 28 diff different studies. 
Um, that dashed line represents zero, so anything to the left of that dashed line uh, indicates a reduction in nitrate leaching. Rye lands in that non-legumes category, um, and that reduced nitrate leaching by over 50%. So we know the literature supports that we know that this cover crop can work. But the question is, how much cover crop biomass do we need? So we have this cover crop that establishes quickly, puts on lots of biomass in spring, but are there any negative effects if we get too much biomass? And how much biomass do we need to reach our conservation goals and also our agronomic goals? Sometimes that rye does such an effective job at taking up soil nitrogen that it depletes those nitrogen pools that would have otherwise been available to that following year's corn crop. So we want to hit that sweet spot where we're reaching our conservation and agronomic goals with the amount of biomass that we're getting. So what we did is we did a trial with four different seeding rates of rye, and we wanted to see how much seed we're putting down and how that affects the amount of biomass we're getting and how we can reach that sweet spot. So I'll walk you through the timeline of the study. This was done at Arlington Research Station. So we have corn, harvest, corn silage harvested in early fall, manure applied right after that corn silage harvest at 10,000 gallons per acre, and the total nitrogen in that manure was about 90 to 125 pounds per acre, um, depending on the year. So after that manure application, rye was planted, overwintered, puts on that biomass in the spring, and then it's terminated in spring just about as early as we can get equipment out into the field. Then corn is planted, corn's then fertilized, and then we had corn harvested for grain yield uh, following that cover crop. So we have our four different rye seeding rates, and this rye was no-till drilled in, so we've got those nice rows, um, and our four seeding rates were 30, 60, 90, and 120, and those percentages are percent green coverage. So we had pretty good ground coverage from all of our seeding rates, 60 at the lowest seeding rate, but then it kind of plateaued at those higher seeding rates. We weren't really seeing an increase in coverage there. So then we also looked at biomass. So on our x-axis there, we have our seeding rates again, and then on our y-axis, we have rye biomass, and this was collected at the time of rye termination. Um, and again, we see that plateau at those higher seeding rates. So at this point, we know it's not really worth it to seed any higher than 60, because you've got that extra cost of seed and we're not really getting any additional benefit there. So we also wanted to see how much nitrogen was in that biomass. We know how much biomass we have, but how much nitrogen did that actually take up from the soil? So that ranged from 40 to 44, again, kind of plateauing at those higher seeding rates and that's in pounds per acre. So now we know how much biomass we have. We kind of know what's going on with the nitrogen in that biomass. But what's going on in the soil profile and how does this affect corn grain yield? And this kind of depended on the two years of the study. We kind of had two different tails here and that was really determined by how much of that nitrogen carried over through the winter in our control plots where no rye was grown when we made that comparison. So now we're going to look at that soil nitrate. So this is in the first two feet of the soil profile. Um, and that soil nitrates in pounds per acre, and then we have our seeding rates, again, then con um, adding in that zero control. So that's where no cover crop was grown. So in our dark blue bars, we've got fall, light blue, we've got spring. Um, in fall, it was sampled right before uh, frost, so that was how much nitrogen was in the soil after those cover crops had already been planted and growing there. And then in spring, it was sampled at the time of termination. So we don't see much reduction in our zero plots. That, that nitrogen and that manure nitrogen really carried over from fall to spring. So we, we see, that, additional nitro we see that, that nitrogen carried over into the spring. And where rye was grown, we saw that decrease. The rye took up nitrogen. It did a great job, did its job. But we do see that reduction in the soil nitrate in the soil profile. So now what does this mean in terms of yield? So corn was planted following that rye. We fertilized with eight different fertilizer rates, and that's how we get these beautiful yield response curves. Um, and then on our, our y-axis, we've got that corn yield in bushels per acre, x-axis those nitrogen fertilizer rates, and then the red line is our control, so that's when corn was planted following no rye, and then we've got our 30 seeding rate in green and our 60 in blue. So if we focus in first on what's happening when no nitrogen was applied, we can see that nitrogen effect, kind of reflective of what's happening in the soil profile. But you can notice that we had a really high yield with no nitrogen application um, when that corn was planted following a bare field. And that red line is pretty flat. It's not really responsive to the addition of nitrogen fertilizer. And then we had our lower yield um, when we had that rye growing because of that nitrogen effect. 
So then we looked at the economic optimum nitrogen rate. And this is the point where an increase in nitrogen returns a yield increase large enough to cover that cost of nitrogen. So basically, what's the best bang for your buck here? If you're putting out nitrogen, are you getting that yield response to pay for it? Um, super low on our, on our red flat line, didn't take much nitrogen to reach that point. But where we had that cover crop, it took a little more nitrogen to reach that economic optimum nitrogen rate. But again, the maximum, the maximum yield was not affected. You can see they all kind of plateaued at about the same time. And where we had cover crop growing, we had as much yield, a little more, than we did when that corn was planted following no cover. So yeah, it took a little bit more nitrogen, but, um, I, but, it didn't, but those yields were able to recover when that nitrogen fertilizer was added. So now we're going to look into that second year. Again, the tale of two winters. Here's our second winter. Um, and we see that reduction where no rye was grown. We see that reduction in soil nitrate um, from fall to spring. And we can assume that was probably leached out of the system. There's nothing growing there. And this nitrogen was reduced from fall to spring. So we have an effect there that wasn't caused by living matter taking up uh, the nitrogen. And then where we have our cover crop, again, did its job, took up soil nitrogen, brought down those soil end levels. But again, all the spring levels went down from fall to spring in all of our treatments, even the control in the second year of the study. So what does this mean in terms of yield? So we have our nitrogen fertilizer rate in pounds per acre again on the x-axis. I did it the same way, eight nitrogen rates, and we've got those beautiful response curves. Um, if we focus in on what was going on at that, at that zero nitrogen rate, we again see that red line, it, it's the highest yield. We got our highest yield um, when corn was planted following no cover. But it was a little, it, was, it had a curve this year. It wasn't quite as flat, and that's because that manure nitrogen leached out. So we didn't see, or that nitrogen from the soil leached out, so we didn't see um, as much of a drastic change when we compared our controls to where we had rye grown. And then again, the cover crop, uh, where we had cover crops grown at zero N, those yields were a little lower. But when we added that nitrogen fertilizer, again, looking at our economic optimum nitrogen rate, it took about 66 pounds per acre um, on, our, on our control to reach that economic optimum point. And interestingly, where we had cover crops, it took about the same. So we didn't really see that uh, nitrogen effect in the second year, again, because the soil profiles in all treatments were drawn down, and that's being reflected in these yield response curves. So what does this mean? We're kind of telling two different stories here, but what does this mean in terms of integrating rye cover crops into this cropping system? First of all, there's really no conserva conservation or agronomic benefit of seeding over the 60 pound per acre rate. It's just increasing your cost in seed, and you're not really seeing any conservation or agronomic benefits of um, seeding over that rate. We also found that rye does not impact maximum grain yield. So those yields were able to recover when we added back that nitrogen fertilizer, and um, we didn't see any agronomic effects in the uh, maximum yield. We also found that rye cover crops utilize that manure end that would be available to corn in some years. Like in that first year, it took up that nitrogen, and in the no control, it, all, it carried over. So it's, it's creating that nitrogen difference, um, but only in some years. So it did, we did need that extra nitrogen was required for corn production in order to uh, reach those economic optimum rates. But since we need to replace the nitrogen from fall manure if it leaches out or if it's taken up by the cover crops, we'd rather have it trapped in that organic material. We've got that, that nitrogen's then staying in the field, it's being tied up in organic biomass, and we're not seeing those negative water quality benefits. So either way, we've kind of, either way we're going to have to replace this nitrogen, whether it's leached out or if it's taken up by the cover crops. So it's much better to have it staying in the field in that cover crop biomass. And from there, I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you. Um, I will just kind of jump right into this because both Matt and Monica have set me up really well for this presentation. So kind of continuing in on this topic of cover crops and water quality in dairy systems. So for this particular study, um, this took place in Rock County. So now we're applying this to a real working farm. And uh, this farm is about 4,000 acres in size. And so it's a crop farm, not a dairy farm. 
unfortunately, but the crops grown on this farm resemble those of what we would see on a typical dairy farm and included corn and soybeans as well as winter wheat and alfalfa acres. So while not a dairy farm, um, it does have similar crops growing. We're going to have the same concerns, same periods of the year where we don't have a living crop on the field unless we're adding a cover crop in. And then in terms of tillage on this farm, they were practicing strip tillage for their corn acres and then no-till was what they were practicing for most of their other acres. And for this particular study, we wanted to look at comparing two different basins and looking at the water quality in those two basins. So in selecting these sites, we had um, identified these two basins that are labeled on the center satellite image here. They are called RE1 and RE5 were the names they were given. Um, and you can see their boundaries are the yellow lines on that image. And so selecting these sites, we wanted two basins that fell within a single crop field so that whatever water quality we're seeing, it can be traced back to what's happening on that farm field. Um, so to do this then, we partnered with the USGS to collect edge of field surface water runoff from the fields um, year round. So this image is showing kind of what that looks like, um, a rough schematic of our monitoring, our setup here. Um, so you can see we have these, a flume that the water is directed into, so that's leaving that basin. And so um, with USGS, then we have this gauge house with refrigerated sample bottles. And so one, there's a runoff going through that flume. It triggers samples to start to be collected. Um, and we keep collecting samples to cover that whole runoff event. And this is year round, so winter, spring, summer, fall, all of it's being captured. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that this was funded by NRCS for this study. So now kind of digging into why we wanted these two basins is because we wanted to do a control and treatment study. Um, so our first basin, RE1, this one served as our control basin, and RE5 was our treatment basin. So we also wanted these to be as similar as we could in terms of size, soil type, slope, those types of factors. Um, so looking at RE1, our control, this basin was about 9.5 acres and about a 2.5% slope, and the predominant soil type was a silt loam. And then in terms of the rotation during the study, it was strip-till corn followed by no-till soybean and then strip-till corn again. And RE5, our treatment, similar size at 9.7 acres, just over a 1% slope. Predominant soil was again a silt loam um, and the same crop rotation. So for this control and treatment setup here, we had three years of monitoring what, what we called our baseline phase, where the two basins were kept exactly the same. Same crop rotation, same tillage passes, um, same type of nutrient applications, everything was the same. And then after we uh, had three years of monitoring, so we captured that full crop rotation, then we added in a cover crop on RE5, our treatment basin, and everything else was kept the same. So now when we look at these results, uh, this is covering a six-year span. Um, there's a seventh year on here. That was the first year of monitoring where the two basins weren't in the same crop rotation, so we didn't include that in the further analysis, but you do see that one on here. Um, but we're covering six years of data, so we're gonna know, we're gonna have some variability because Mother Nature isn't gonna be consistent and give us the same amount of precipitation and timing from year to year. So this was something we wanted to acknowledge and also take into consideration when we look at the results later. Um, so you can see here, there's a red line that's dividing our baseline phase to our experiment phase, and then the, the black horizontal line that is the 30-year precipitation average for the sites. Um, so most of the years we had above average precipitation, but there was um, two years that were below average. And then looking at our runoff data, um, you can see, again, we have some variability in our data. Um, this time that horizontal line going across the graph, that is the Discovery Farms uh, median for runoff observed. So um, Discovery Farms has been monitoring um, farm fields since the early 2000s, so that's taking all that data together, what's the average we see on, on farms. So you can see looking at this then, we have some years that are above that average, some that are below. Um, so again, want to take that into consideration, but another thing to, to notice on this graph is that 
Most of those bars, most of that runoff was made up of the lighter blue color, so that's frozen soil conditions um, when that runoff happened. So that's going to be mostly snow melt or uh, rainfall in the spring before the, the ground has thawed and can't really infiltrate any of that water. So now moving into these results, I'll show this a few ways here, um, but I want to focus your attention to the top graph to begin with, and this is looking at runoff during our baseline phase and then our experiment phase for the two basins. Um, so starting with the baseline phase, you can see RE5 had more runoff, than, so our treatment basin had more runoff than our control basin. And when we go to the experiment phase, after adding that cover crop, it still had more runoff. But now when we shift to that bottom graph, looking at the phosphorus losses, we can see um, in the baseline monitoring that our uh, treatment basin, RE5, had almost double the amount of total phosphorus losses as our control basin, but after adding in that cover crop, our total phosphorus losses were pretty much equal between the two basins. So I'm looking at this another way where we're trying to kind of take into account the variability in um, the amount of precipitation or runoff we had in those two phases. Here we're looking specifically at paired runoff events, so where there was runoff at both the sites at the same time and looking at the relationship between those two basins and graphing that. So the top one is looking at runoff and the open circles, that's from our baseline phase and the filled in circles are from our experimental um, phase after adding the cover crop in. So when you look at the runoff, you can see those data points, they're really overlapping. Um, when you look at the trend line fitted, they're pretty close to each other, again, overlapping. And so we run, when we ran the statistics on that, there was not a significant change because of adding the cover crop when we consider runoff. But then when you look at the bottom one, the phosphorus, you can see the experimental data points, the filled in circles, those have now kind of shifted down on that graph. You look at the, the trend line fitting that relationship between the two basins, um, it shifted down as well. And so when we run the statistics on that, it was a significant change in the relationship by adding that cover crop. It was a, a reduction to the phosphorus by adding the cover crop. Then, I'm um, looking at nitrogen, which Monica set me up well for this. Um, again, looking at the two base, basins um, during that baseline phase, you see RE5 again had higher losses, but then when we um, added that cover crop in, it actually had lower nitrogen losses. And then graphing this again, looking at those paired events, we see um, the Experimental data points, they've shifted down again on that graph, and it was, again, a significant change in that relationship, um, and that those cover crops did indeed reduce the nitrogen. Um, so I just want to wrap it up together and then tying it back into dairy systems today. Um, and Monica hit on this point really well, that corn silage acres in the dairy, dairy system, those are really good candidate for adding in cover crops. Um, because of their early harvest and their really vulnerable soils in a typical dairy rotation being left bare. Um, so we can get some cover crops established before freezing. So those would be a good candidate to look for for adding cover crops in. Um, and I do want to highlight some ongoing work that Discovery Farms has going right now related to cover crops and dairy systems. So one of these studies is happening in Marathon County where we are looking at um, two different dairy farms one is a large CAFO farm, and the other one is a smaller grazing dairy farm. So our large farm, they're trying to apply year-round cover to one of their row crop fields, and we're comparing the losses on that versus um, a pasture on that grazed dairy farm. So to see if we have year-round cover on a field versus a pasture, what are the, the differences in the losses we're seeing? And then the second study we have going on right now is in Pepin County looking at the impact of cover crops on nitrogen leaching, again, on a dairy, on a dairy farm. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I think we'll have Monica and Matt come back up for questions. Great, let's do a quick thank you.
Well, I have a question for Monica. So in your study, you mentioned you had the manual being applied in four November. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, application method uh, to what depths? The reason I'm asking that is I noticed that the soil sampling depth was from zero to two inches. Any reason tied being to the uh, application or that's just based on the cover crop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was zero to two feet. Um, the soil sampling was zero to two feet. And the manure was applied, it was surface applied to the hold field. So it was just broadcast over the soil. Okay, and further to that question, you mentioned there's a review study on the cover crop, effect of cover crop on the um, nutrient uh, in the soil. Mm -hmm. In that review, did you notice or do you remember, do they include the factor of application uh, method in that study? Um, so in that review, it wasn't specifically, manure wasn't specifically one of the factors in that, but that was just to show that cover crops take up nitrogen from the soil and reduce nitrate leaching. Um, but manure wasn't specifically anything that they, they may have included it as like a factor, but it wasn't something that they explicitly talked about. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, have any studies, or is there any way of studying uh, the effect of this leached out nitrogen or phosphorus, either longitudinally or geographically, to see if increased leaching of those elements contributes to problems downstream, like uh, algal bloom or related complications, or would that be too ambitious an undertaking? Thanks. Um, I can't think of anything specifically that looks into that, but I think we know if those if those nutrients are leaving the field, they're definitely causing algal blooms. So there has been studies that look at that, that um, that pollution coming from fields or even lawns, any fertilizer that you're putting out, pollution that is going into those waterways is definitely leading to some co consequences, leading to hypoxia in those uh, waterways and definitely leading to some algal blooms. I was just curious if you had taken any samples of the microbial communities and getting any metagenomic data back on it to better understand like the pathways being used and whether it changed throughout the year. Yes, great question. So yeah, that was actually kind of a factor in my master's thesis. Um, I looked at enzymes, I looked at beta-glucosidase and urease. Beta-glucosidase is just kind of a first, it's an enzyme that's released by microorganisms to kind of start the breakdown process of organic matter. Um, and we didn't really find any differences in those in cover crops between the cover crops and the control. But again, this is just the first year of cover crops on that field, so we wouldn't really expect huge changes in soil biological communities. Um, but there, have been, there has been some indication in other work, um, there's been some meta-analyses and things done that show that cover crops do increase um, soil biology. Um, and then I also did a litter bag study. So I put some of that rye biomass in a mesh bag, put it on the field, on top of the field, um, in plots where there was cover crop and where there wasn't cover crop and where there was nitrogen application, um, nitrogen fertilizer application, and then where there wasn't any. Um, and we did find kind of an interesting effect there that the residue broke down faster in the plots where the rye already was. So there is some sort of maybe priming effect of having that residue there um, and it kind of excites the biological community and makes it more capable of breaking down those, um, that biomass. But we only had one year on data in that, so I didn't want to make any bold conclusions there. Um, but the study is actually going on again now. Corn's just getting planted this week. So we do have, we'll have another um, round of the biomass there from the litter bags. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. But did the rye uh, residue remain on the field? Yes. So then do you think you had denitrification? Um, the reason why there was less nitrogen available for the next planting? Um, that, that could be. There could be some denitrification happening. But I think most of it is just that, that nitrogen is taken up in the biomass. 
Um, I mean, we had we had 40 pounds in just the above ground biomass, mm -hmm. and in the second year we actually looked at below ground biomass too, and that adds another 10 to 20 pounds of uptake. So our our assumptions are that it's just kind of trapped in that biological material, and as those microbes are breaking it down, it might also be getting trapped in the microbial biomass, and it's just not being released to the corn in that growing season. And there's been some other literature that supports that as well. So you did soil testing, and this, but the soil testing did show that there was lower nitrogen available for plants though? Yes, yes we did, yep. Okay, thank you. Yep, and we did an in-season soil test as too and that kind of indicated the same thing in the growing season. Thank you. Uh, thanks to each of you for helping me know probably infinitely more than I knew about soil health before <laughs> I came in uh, this morning. Uh, Matt probably knows where I'm gonna go with this uh, given that we serve on the steering committee for the Hub together, but. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of the more practical implications of actually trying to do this, say, particularly in a dairy farm setting. I think a lot about kind of what the economics or the business component of it is, but are there incentives that we think would need to be given to kind of adopt the practices you're thinking about or to have us move in the direction of something that looks a bit more like a pasture-based system than an annual cropping system? So maybe you can talk a little bit about but, you know, you had some great information. Can we take that information and have it kind of be used more directly by farms to actually get the kind of benefits you're talking about? So thanks. Well, right. So to start right with pasture, that, that conversion of, from a traditional system to a pasture, that's a whole other set of economics. But uh, we like to use, pa like in the pasture, the way I like to use it is just sort of the context of what's the What's the bar? Like how high can we achieve if we're gonna utilize the landscape for agriculture? So it kind of sets, sets us up for like, where are we at? If you can get your row crops soil looking like a pasture soil, then you're in, you're in good shape, right? Okay, so, but as it, comes to the, uh, as it comes to the practice of cover cropping, I actually, I debated even putting the title of, you know, the, the million acre challenge. We've got about a million acres of corn silage in the state. Can we get a million acres of cover crops? Right, it fits in perfectly. Like it's easy to, to get a, easy, right? Find time, but the cover crops grow, right? And the big problem with all, you know, when we talk about cover crops for most other production systems, they don't grow. We get them in too late. They don't, they can't, they're not producing enough biomass to have that benefit. But it's a system that works. And you throw in the manure at the time and, and we have to trap it. And the big elephant in the room, right, is we don't know for certain if we put out the manure in the fall, if that nitrogen is going to be available in the spring. So we have to make some decisions about what we want. Do we want to, uh, you know, if we have to make a guess and hope that it carries over, but if it doesn't, that has some big limitations, plus we have to replace it. Uh, or do we want to just say, let's just trap it um, and, uh, and, uh, and just, you know, manage it from that. So that's a good, but there's other technologies, right? There's, still, there's a lot of other stuff we didn't talk about. We can just simply also move the manure application to later and in, later into the fall too, you know, that we, there's all sorts of timings and uh, there's a discussion about inhibitor products and all of those interactions we're just scratching at the surface of really exploring and creating some empirical data on. So, uh, so and then also how does it fit in and what are the costs? It sounds like an economic issue. <laughs> so I'd have to defer back to, back to you, John. Is that, does that answer your question or does that get on the topics you wanted to? Okay. Yeah, I, I like your perspective on this. A lot of our research is very short term. We'll do studies for a year or two and come to conclusions. And I'm just curious with cover cropping systems, if we implement them for five or 10 years, uh, does the system get to some sort of an equilibrium that would give a different outcome than what we see from our one or two year studies? And should we be looking at that? Should the hub be funding longer term work to be able to answer these kind of questions? Uh, absolutely, they should be funding my work for long, long periods of time. <laughs> By the way, he paid me to say, uh, ask that question, so. <laughs> but this highlights, so this highlights a, a, this 
kind of another broader theme, right? We, we can do, you know, the, the work that, that Monica was doing and even some of the, the, you know, the work that Lindsay's doing. We have these immediate, there's these immediate effects of cover crops, right? We have an implementation of a management practice, uh, something new that we want to do. And then what's the immediate benefit? And then what's the long-term benefit? Well, so then it either we have to go to the idea of setting up a long-term trial or doing, you know, replacing space for time, like, I, like we demonstrated in that first presentation, right? Just doing a lot of sampling on farm fields. You know, the other big thing, that was, that was just a scratch at the, uh, at the surface in that data set, right? Because we had to collect all the information about um, from each farm related to the inherent soil properties, the texture, the drainage class, related to the, the long-term nature of their management. How long have they been in no-till? How long have they been applying manure? How long have they been applying cover crops? We couldn't really get into the cover crop question yet. Really, we haven't had enough experiment or sampling on long-term cover crop sites, or perhaps we don't have enough. Uh, for the few amount of short studies that are out there, you know, Monica alluded to it, yes, there, we're, we're seeing benefits in terms of soil health and, and, and maybe even uh, potential yield uh, on these fields as we increase organic matter, increase uh, soil biological properties. But that then transitions a little bit into maybe what we want to also try to, what we're working uh, more on with Discovery Farms, with the nitrogen optimization pilot program through DACCAP, which Monica uh, is, is serving as a, as a lead on, is conducting more experiments on farm and to reflect the immediate nature of things we want to study, but also the long-term nature of the practices that have been on that farm. And so uh, utilizing the entire farming community in the state as, a, as, the, as our collaborators in soil science research. So, and so far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and just through the work that I've done in the uh, nitrogen optimization pilot program and the conversations I've had with farmers, kind of as we're talking about how they, how they came up with these project ideas, and a lot of them wanted to look at nitrogen rates following cover crops. They wanted to see if they're getting, if they're having any negative effects or if they're having um, maybe a positive effect um, on nitrogen availability. And an issue I, we ran into is having them have a no cover crop control. Because they're already putting cover crops out. And they're like, I don't know. You want me to put not put cover crops on half my field? Because it's, it's a tool that was working for them. They can get their machinery out on the fields faster. They, they find it easier to plant. Um, and they're seeing these benefits from implementing this on their fields. And it's, it's, you see it on the landscape because it's working for certain people. So I think that's a big thing, too. And we're just, we're just trying to figure out how, in these first years, how we can increase adoption of that by giving some sort of recommendations for nitrogen management. Awesome. I, I do want to put a pin in the idea of progress, right? So 10, 15 years ago, we weren't having a Dairy Hub Symposium. We were not having um, this idea that we could reach a million acres of cover crops. We were not having this idea of like, maybe we need to move some of these studies to long-term cover crop or longer-term no-till sites because they really were not very common. And so over the last 10 to 15 years, the, a the action that has created a commonality across the landscape of being able to do this work on a variety of uh, farms that have been using cover crops for a longer period or have been using no-till plus cover crops for a longer period is a really exciting opportunity. So I uh, th really want to thank all of you for sharing your time and talents with us today. Thank you all for your good questions. And that brings us to the end of our session and you get to go to lunch. So, Perfect. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.